My name is Ted Kasek and uh, I'm a professor here in the Daniels faculty. Uh, it's my privilege to coordinate this uh, lecture series and my only regret is that tonight is the fourth and last lecture of this year's very successful series and thanks to all of you that have made that possible by participating. Uh, at this point in time, I wish to extend our sincere appreciation for the generous support provided by Tremco Roofing and Maintenance over the past five years. It's, it's been a five-year joyride that's uh, really been a thrill, and without their support, this event uh, would not have been possible. Uh, for those of you who are first-time attendees to the series, uh, each lecture qualifies for two hours of OAA structured learning credits, and um, you know, you can pick up the forms and fill them out and leave them and we will process a certificate and get it to you as long as you write your email address legibly. It's a little bit of work and as I've told people before, when we get stuck we have to take your forms over to pharmacy and they translate them for us. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, you can leave them uh, outside when you're done. So, so if you haven't picked them up now, there's lots of time afterwards uh, and, and you can fill them out while you're enjoying the reception. Uh, before introducing uh, the speakers for this evening, uh, I would like to invite Sean uh, McCallum of Tremco to welcome you personally to tonight's lecture. Sean. Thanks very much, Ted. Uh, as Ted said, my name is Sean McCallum. I'm the uh, regional manager for uh, Ontario here for Tremco Roofing and Building Maintenance. Uh, and as Ted alluded to, it has been a five-year joyride. It's been a real pleasure to be associated with uh, this lecture series and to see it grow over the course of the, uh, these five years. Um, for those of you who don't know, Tremco Roofing uh, and Building Maintenance is a local manufacturer of uh, high-end roofing materials. Here in Toronto, we've got three facilities in Leaside. We'd be happy to take you for a tour at any time if anyone wants to go through there. It's a phenomenal operation, zero landfill, very impressive, uh, sustainable sort of uh, uh, manufacturing facility that we have uh, in Leaside there. Um, this is uh, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, when I got hired with Tremco uh, about eight years ago, my focus was on green roofing uh, in the public sector, so I'm really excited to see this. And actually, I've been to a number of these uh, lectures, and this is, I think, the first time I've seen the word roofing in the, uh, in the, in the topic, so very excited about that. We've been uh, a part of a number of, of high-profile green roofs uh, in Toronto here. Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head here. Paul helped me out, drawing a blank. Uh, the YMCA, the new uh, project uh, uh, for the Pan Am Games. Uh, Covenant House is a big one. Uh, and the, yeah, of course, Union Station, the biggest one in Toronto. And then uh, last but not least, the Grit Lab uh, on top of this building here. Uh, we're happy to announce we just sort of re-upped to sponsor the, the project go that goes on uh, above uh, on, on the roof up here at the Daniels faculty. So we're very excited about that. Um, lastly, I, I just want to say, you know, we, uh, we take a, a great deal of pride in, in being a part of these educational initiatives. Um, the way we like to think of it is as we're, we're, we're helping to raise the bar for designing uh, better buildings. So um, we hope that when you get out there in the real world and you're designing better buildings, uh, you'll be designing buildings with better roofs. Uh, and when you design better roofs, that you'll think of Tremco. So thanks again for your attendance and your support. Uh, and we look forward to uh, this evening's lecture. Thank you. I don't know a lot about green roofs, but um, one of our guest speakers who's an expert installer of them did give me some very valuable advice. He says, when you're installing them, Ted, he said, make sure you put them green side up. And so I think that's something to always keep in mind. I didn't know that. I, I said, but why don't we just put them brown side up? Because half of them end up that color within a few months anyway. But uh, that's another story. I, I'm not talking about green roofs in Toronto. I'm thinking of other, of other municipalities. Uh, like my hometown of Sudbury, where green roofs really take a beating. Um, the three guest speakers for uh, tonight's panel, and, and you've, you've got their information on the poster, so I'm not going to present brief bios of them, but the, the three members are, are Joe DeBramo, City of Toronto, and uh, Scott Torrance, Landscape Architect, and uh, Rick Buist of BioRoof. And the reason I put them in this order is that the City of Toronto came out with the bylaw, and then, of course, the landscape architect has to figure out what the green roof design is going to be. And then the baton is passed on to the person who actually has to make the thing work. And so I thought that would be the logical order for tonight's presentations. 
Uh, each of them is going to make a brief presentation and then we're going to have a panel discussion followed by an open question period. So uh, at this point, it is my pleasure to welcome them all and I would ask that uh, Joe DeBram will come up to make the first presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ted, and good evening, everyone. Um, so my presentation, uh, there we go, um, is on the City of Toronto perspective, and I want to just focus on that word perspective for a moment, um, because I think that is really at the crux of this particular topic and a lot of other ones we get involved in, in terms of environmental planning at the city. Um, you get a lot of proponents, uh, you get advocates, um, and you get a lot of opponents. I've spent uh, many a time with opponents of green roofs and listening to why um, they don't work. So everyone comes at it from a different perspective and they think they have the right answer and they have facts behind them as well. And I think that's a particular uh, issue um, uh, with this and other um, initiatives like this. And at the City of Toronto, of course, our perspective is that of policymaker and of regulator. Basically, that's where we're coming from. So when we attack this particular issue, it's how do we deal with the policy and how do we deal with the, um, the fact that we're regulators. And regulation is an important part of what we do, but um, it's not just enough to say that we have the authority to regulate. It's about understanding the responsibility that comes with regulation. And that's the story of the City of Toronto when it comes to this. So to start off with the perspective, it's really about the city itself and, and, and kind of how we're growing. And of course, when you look at the city, you're looking at a city that, um, it, and by the time uh, we get to 2031, we're expecting as many as 3.2 million people. Same uh, piece of land, 630 uh, square kilometers, and that creates a real challenge for us in terms of how do we fit them within that same um, confines. We also are dealing with uh, more people traveling. And of course, the same thing, we're not building more roads, but we have plenty of people traveling, and you've certainly heard about the transit debates that are going on right now in the city. And we can put people in transit, of course, but we can't put goods into transit, so we still need those roads for goods. And when it comes to that, it's very interesting. We just finished a, 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 some, some work that showed that, uh, this is in the West End, looking at air quality. Um, trucks uh, and, that move those goods, they account for about 25% of the vehicle um, movement, but they account for as much as 50% of the air pollution. So. With that still is that air pollution concern that we're faced with as a pressure here in the city. And when it comes to development, um, you can see by this slide, um, it's doing one thing and that's going up. Um, we're rebuilding on, on sites um, with taller and taller buildings. And that poses its, it, its own uh, uh, difficulty for us as well is because we have um, uh, some infrastructure that's very old and, and uh, refurbishing that infrastructure to deal with that density becomes cha more challenging each time. So uh, for us, the word conservation is really important in everything we do. So, so that's, that's an important aspect of, of how we see the city when we're looking at these issues. Another important aspect that's kind of more um, uh, top of mind these days is, of course, uh, how our weather is changing. And on this slide here, I just want to focus on a, uh, some work that we did. This is from our Environment and Energy Office. Uh, this is our own work that shows that uh, when it comes to these two items of, of rainfall and temperature, when it comes to rainfall, we're looking at uh, the same number of storms uh, over the years. This is in a period um, from uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, 20, 2040 to 2049. So in the future, we're looking at the same number, but, but what we're looking at is also a much greater intensity, as you can see by the, on the graph on the left there, uh, the uh, kind of purplish pinkish line. There's a, a big peak on the intensity of storms, and that really poses a real threat to us, especially with things like basement flooding, as you probably have heard about. And also with temperature. Temperature becomes another issue for us because we have a situation where we're going to have increasing numbers of of a temperature ra a range of over 30, days of over 30 degrees Celsius. And that really is a big thing. When you combine that with how we're developing, we're building these condos, high-rise condos, glass, of course, uh, and using a lot of air conditioning, we're dealing with an issue around that peak low demand for electricity. Um, this is some work we did back in 2005 in preparation for the green roof um, uh, policy and then eventual bylaw. And uh, we had the uh, consultant team look at the city. And this is a, a shot of thermal imagery, which is kind of saying blue and green is cool and, and orange and red is hot. And we circled the areas where we have, we call the so-called hot spots. 
And, and when you look closer at them, you have a situation where we're really focused in on areas with a lot of flat roofs. In fact, uh, the study found that there are about 5,000 hectares of flat roofs in the city. Now, this is of a certain threshold size and above. There's actually probably even more, but nonetheless, we're looking at about 5,000. 5,000 is, um, Rouge Park is about 5,800 hectares. So, we, you know, when you talk about 5,000 hectares of, of, of roof, flat, flat roof area, you're talking about a great deal of area here in the city. And so, so you can see that by the thermal imagery, uh, Park Lake setting will be nice and cool, and those flat roofs are very hot. And that, that goes to the point of the urban heat island effect, which is another pressure point for the city, right? So the city, and it, the way it's developing, um, with less and less uh, natural landscape, it, it hasn't got that um, natural cooling process. We are heating up, and we do have a higher temperature. And, and we know that from this study, in the theory, if we can get those roofs to be uh, in a green state, green roof state, uh, we can actually lower the ambient air temperature in the city if we're going to do them all. Now, that's, that's a, perhaps, it is a, just a theoretical exercise. I, I can't imagine it's going to happen right away. Maybe one day it will, but it is certainly a, 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 a goes to the point of what we're trying to deal with in terms of a pressure. Now, um, in terms of uh, our approach, so we're, we kind of said, okay, well, we have to start thinking differently about the city. You know, when you, when you think back, what just went through with those slides, all those pressure points of the city in terms of how it's developing and its pressures on our infrastructure and its pressures on our, our environment, you know, we, we have to think differently and, and how we might um, alleviate those uh, or mitigate those particular pressures. And when it came to the green roofs uh, topic, we thought, well, this is interesting. Let's look at it. And, and this slide here is really trying to go to the point of how we approach things. So we, we do all these steps in order to get to that kind of final step. We don't move, we move for some people perhaps slowly, but when it comes to uh, government initiatives, it's probably more important that we do it right and we get people involved so that we get people's understanding and buy-in of it. That, that's really important when, it, when I think you're moving into these kind of new fields or, of endeavor. You're trying to move um, uh, uh, minds as well as technology. So we did a lot of consultation, a lot of research. I showed you some of it already. Uh, education is really important. Getting the message out about uh, green roofs and how it works, what, what benefits they are to the city. And then finally, we get to adoption. So that was kind of the steps that we take. So the first place that we looked at when we, we thought of how do we implement green roofs is we said, well, we need to take a leadership role. That's a really kind of an important part of it. Because when we did our first bits of consultation with the industry, the industry kind of right away said, well, fine, you want to make us do this, but what about yourselves? And that was really an important message. So we, we, we do have our own set of policies that apply to our city uh, buildings. And in fact, they're more stringent than they are to the private sector. So we do put up green roofs um, on our own buildings, uh, such as this one at the Toronto Police Services Training Facility. Um, we then moved into the initiative of the Green Roof Bylaw. Having imposed it by policy on ourselves, we looked at the Green Roof Bylaw. And just to mention on the Green Roof Bylaw, which is really important here, is that um, we were very fortunate uh, at the city to, at least from my perspective, and again, depends on where you're coming from, but we were, we were able to get from the province the um, authority to actually pass a bylaw. So it's very unique, right? So um, when you look at other municipalities in Ontario, they don't have the same authority we have. So we do have a special section in our City of Toronto Act, 108, that allows us to uh, pass a bylaw to require green roofs and to set out a construction standard for them. And that's what we ended up doing with this. And I, and I just want to show you the other thing that, uh, about this slide is kind of important is the icon over there. This is from our Toronto Green Standard. Um, it, the, the, the green roof, that this is the one great thing that we noticed right away is that it has multiple benefits. That's what the, all those different icons are trying to distribute, uh, to, to um, imply. And when it came to the green roof bylaw, um, Again, the, the interesting thing is that it's a, it becomes a bylaw. And so uh, you start to say, okay, if we're going to require this of people, it has this real um, certain effect. And people look at it very differently. So um, the first part that we had to think about is how will it affect all the different people who want to apply. So we applied it to as many building types as we could. 
um, and we got pushed back on industrial. Uh, and we also got pushed back on a, the, um, the size. Where would you start? So we did start at a certain threshold size. So you had to have a minimum of 2,000 square meters of building uh, size to, to, uh, to have the, um, the green roof apply to you. And then we also had a graduated scale. So as the building increased in size, you went from a minimum of 20% 20 20 coverage of your roof for green to as much as 60% coverage of your roof for green. So, so that came out of, of discussions with the people that helped build the city. So in other words, you can't really uh, push issues like this uh, from one corner only. You can't look at it just from the perspective of advocates and say, well, these are, this is great. Can't you see all the benefits? Yes, it, you can. But you do have to concern yourself with how this stuff that this gets implemented, and that's that responsibility that comes along with regulation. I think that's very important. We also developed our own uh, green roof construction standard. Again, a unique uh, bit of work that uh, we've done here in Toronto that no one else has done, uh, and it sets out the minimum requirements for uh, constructing a green roof. And um, you know that really served a, a, a true point because again, when you're looking at the introducing something new like this. There are some people that are ahead of the curve that are involved and they know what they're doing and there are others that are just coming to the party and they're trying to understand, well, what, what is it? How do, where do I go? And the construction standard has proven to be very helpful. It has its uh, problems as well because it is uh, a standard and it what you tend to do with a lot of these things is you tend to, you, um, uh, as this slide, will tr I'll try to explain what we use in this slide, is when we, you take an item and you put it into regulation that is that it applies everywhere or most everywhere except for exceptions of course you tend to lower your expectations right you go to the lowest common denominator because it's got to apply to everyone it's it's a fact it always happens and this slide shows this so when you look at this slide and we got this big black bar there. Below it, you have things such as the Ontario Building Code, and you have the zoning body. These are requirements on everything, so you tend to bring your standards down because they have to apply to everyone, and people complain a lot if they're not able to do it. So above that, you can see all these items that we work on in the city, um, Climate Change Action Plan of Toronto, Green Standard up there, the Wet Weather Flow Management Guidelines, and even the Municipal, uh, municipal Official Plan, which has some sort of legal status, but still is a policy document. These are policy. They're not involving specific properties. So you, you have this situation where when, when you come down to regulations, you tend to lower yourself. But it's interesting. With the green roof bylaw, I think this is the, 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 the part that I find intriguing as a planner is that this was an additional um, uh, opportunity to, for us to create a regulation that we didn't have a power for. So in fact, even though we've, we've created the Green Roof Bylaw, and, and I would suggest that by doing that, we had to bring it down to a, a status where most people can comply, it still raises the bar overall because it's something new. It's added as a regulation. And I think that was a big achievement. And, and I think the success of it so far is, is testament to that achievement. And I think that's really important to note how the, these policies and regulations play out here at the city. Um, very important for us to kind of balance ourselves in, in terms of how we enforce either policies or regulations. Um, so in terms of the green roof, um, what we discovered and w when we looked at it more, uh, more detailed, they had multiple benefits, which is really the difference here. Because we, do, we did get a lot of pushback to say, well, why, why not cool roofs or other alternatives? But the great thing about the green roof is it has these multiple benefits, you know, reducing stormwater, heat island effect, reducing energy consumption. We do require a green roof over heated areas of the buildings only, by the way. That's really important to note. Um, it provides natural green spaces, and it adds to biodiversity. That's the latest bit of work we did, uh, which is, is kind of interesting as well as another, another benefit of it. And we actually had um, uh, Halso, we hired Halso to look at this whole issue because it was at one point when we first introduced the Green Roof Pilot, there was tremendous pushback. You wouldn't believe it, it does not accept it. 
And, and the pushback was, especially the traditional roofers, they just they, they didn't know what to do with this. They wanted, the, they wanted to go more to kind of things like cool roofs. But when Hausa looked at the options for alternatives, they really concluded that you can't find anything that has the multiple benefits of a green roof. So we felt satisfied that, you know, that probably was the right decision to make. We've done a good job with our research, and the bylaw itself um, stood that test. And uh, we're very pleased with that outcome. Um, so, um, in terms of our achievements, uh, the Green Roof Bylaw took effect uh, January 31st, 2010, um, and uh, since then we've had about 458 development applications. That's probably a low number we, um, because there are some applications that we don't actually see. These are the ones we actually see within uh, city planning. Um, that, that amounts to about 245,000 square meters of committed green, green roof. Committed, and, and the reason why I say committed is because um, it, it, development in the city takes time. <laughs> so you, you go through an approval process that could take a year, year and a half. Then you got the construction period, which could be another year and a half, or maybe more. So, so there are a lot of committed green roofs. They're not, uh, and they're not as many built at this time, but they are coming on on stream. Um, uh, interestingly enough, about the cash and loop, that is a provision in the bylaw that says you can buy your way out. For $200 a square meter, you can buy your way out of providing a green roof. Uh, and you can do it by removing a part of it, or you can, do, you can go for a total exemption, but you're buying your way out. We've only had 24 of them in all that time, and most of them are really just reductions. What they found is that the roof configuration was so unique that they couldn't actually meet the the percentage requirement. So they had to kind of nick out a bit. So that really, that's all it was. For the most part, um, we haven't had this, this rush for total exemptions. Could be the price, don't know, but if it is, then we set the right price. Um, for, for, there are also 40 uh, volunteer green roofs. There are people that uh, put up green roofs because they think it is the right thing to do or it's a great thing to do. Um, so that's going on. Um, and there are also the solar PV installations that um, uh, are allowed and mixed with a green roof, and if you provide the solar PV installation, you don't have to provide the green roof on that portion of the, um, of the roof. Um, and in terms of in industrial uh, uh, buildings, there was a pushback by the industry. Um, they felt as though they couldn't uh, provide green roofs. And, um, and for them, we did provide an opportunity for them to, to have a reduction of the amount of area. So it's only 10% of the roof area that's provided for, uh, on their buildings for green roofs. Now, I know it doesn't sound like much, but they have big green roof, uh, big roofs, like really large roofs. So the 10%. Or they are also have an option for a cool roof uh, replacement. But it's not just cool roof. There is a certain amount of stormwater collection that is also required. I'm going to talk about schools in a second, a little later on. It kind of is a good story around that. Uh, here's some examples of uh, some uh, development that uh, is in place or is coming about in place that will be um, uh, using green roofs here in the city. We've also created an eco roof incentive program started in 2009, uh, and the eco roof incentive program is um, a kind of a revolving fund at this point. It started with a lump sum, but the money of you know the exemption money I talked about, where people want an exemption or a variance from the green roof bylaw, well, that money goes into the eco roof incentive program. So it gets turned over, and it um, helps to um, uh, provide incentives for the construction of, of green roofs on uh, existing buildings. Okay, so you, you get a basically you get 75 uh, if you apply you get $75 per square meter as uh, as a um, a rebate uh, or refund whatever uh, towards the purchase of a green roof. So we do have this kind of revolving fund around the exemption in the eco roof incentive program. Um, another issue that has come up recently, and actually the Grit Lab actually brought this to a lot of people's attention just uh, last year, and this is the whole notion of okay, we're getting, we're getting green roofs. Um, what about their functioning, their ongoing functioning? So, uh, first of all, I should tell you that if the, if you read the green roof bylaw itself, there's a um, in the construction standard, there's a there's a, a requirement for a maintenance plan, for example. So, and that maintenance plan essentially um, requires that. Uh, you have to bring that out to full growth over a period of three years. So there, there is a, a, a requirement to see that it is brought to its fullest potential at when it's first developed. But I think there's some 
concern about, well, how is this going to be um, enforced in the future so we don't have, as Ted points out, all these wonderful yellow or brown type of green roofs looking like they're upside down. So, so this, this is a study that looks at, is taking um, um, imagery, it's, um, oh, what was the, I forgot the... Thermography? Yeah, no, it isn't actually. Uh, hmm? Uh, no, sorry. I have to look at my notes. Four band, four band imagery and eight band imagery. Are you guys familiar with that, anyone? Four band and eight band imagery, which uh, looks at, uh, at uh, so we've, we've hired a consultant to look at the green roofs in a selected area between Bloor, Bathurst, Don, and, and Queens Key right now is what they're looking at specifically, uh, to see if we can, we can create a, mo a model or method for um, using this to, to um, um, basically keep track of green roofs and their health. Essentially what you see there is that um, it's using uh, light and, and it's a reflection. So uh, I think what I think they say is that the chlorophyll shows up green in, in, in this particular light band. Uh, so the, this, uh, the, the darker green areas here you're seeing are essentially healthy green roofs, right? And then once you get to yellow, they're not. So it's a way of trying to understand for ourselves going ahead in the future um, who's maintaining them and who's not. And then we can, we always have the power of enforcement, but I don't think it's the type of enforcement that we want to go, you know, to every building. I think we're trying to figure out, well, you know, how are the, where are the problem areas first? And we're trying to use this type of um, technology to help us. Now, just uh, uh, to conclude here with some of the stuff going forward here, uh, this slide here shows a, a wonderful grain roof um, with a lot of cash crops on there, and, and it's pretty neat. Um, I have to tell you, the green roof bylaw wouldn't allow that. But, but that's interesting. So again, so the reason why I point that out, though, is because there's this interesting, there's an, this is another issue, right? You're dealing with issues here at the city, and as a regulator, you're, you're kind of saying, what do you do? This one is about urban agriculture. Right? So a lot of people are into urban agriculture, um, don't have a lot of space on, on the ground, people are looking to the roofs. Uh, so the issue is, you know, uh, should we be allowing them on the roof? If we're allowing them on the roof, you know, does it conflict with the green roof bylaw? It's something we're going to have to look at in the future. But it's definitely, it, it, it is one of these issues of, of we didn't really think of this type as a green roof. So, uh, so this is one thing that we uh, certainly have to come up with, uh, com will be coming up. Now, in terms of uh, the roofs themselves, uh, in terms of the benefits, I remember I, li I listed their uh, biodiverse green roofs. We did a study uh, of, uh, just last year and we came up with guidelines for a biodiverse green roof. So this is moving into, um, you know, a kind of a whole different look to, uh, to green roofs other than the kind of, we were having a discussion before this, the, 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 where we started from is everything was going to be a sedum style uh, green roof. I think we're, we're looking and realizing they could be different things. And, and certainly this particular guideline uh, will help um, in that approach. Um, and, and I just uh, here just want to conclude um, w with the, the story about the, uh, the schools, which is really kind of interesting about how, where we came from. So, you know, we started with this notion about a green roof, uh, and there were a lot of uh, enthusiastic people that approached us initially. And we, like I said, we went through this tremendous process of trying to educate ourselves, educate others around us about what they could be before we got to the point of actually regulating them. And in that period, the, the school boards came up last year, or maybe the year before, and they waved their hands and said, oh, no, no, look, you, we don't want to put on green roofs, too expensive, um, you know, we don't get money from the province for this, blah, 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 blah. And it was really, they really pushed very, very hard, which is kind of it's disappointing for me as a, uh, as a planner at the city, because I thought they were kind of on our side, and they were, and they got kids, kids are really interested in this. So anyways, um, they really pushed hard. We wrote a report to um, council to say, well, you know, if they want to be exempt, you know, here's maybe a way you can exempt them, much like the industrial buildings. And council said, no, <laughs> provide the green roofs. So, there, so there, to me, that's an example of how we've moved, right? Not just as a technology, because to me, this is, green roof is a technology. It's like, how, is the, how are these things done? And you're gonna hear about this, right? How are these things done? But it's, it's how those minds have moved, right? And especially those on, on council as to, you know, well, how they see it, they see a value in this. So I think that uh, that's uh, the way I'd like to end it um, in terms of the city's perspective on this.
was a great presentation, Joe. Thank you very much. Um, nice to be here. My name's Scott Torrance. Uh, I studied at University of Toronto in the 90s, so it's nice to be back in room, uh, this room. I'm also pleased um, to work in a city that has a green roof bylaw. It's fantastic, and I think what's really important uh, as a side piece to this, for those of you don't, who don't know this, is that there is a truly world-class uh, green roof research lab now located in Toronto on the roof of this building. And my firm is pleased to be a, a special sponsor of that, of that uh, facility to help both our work and also to support the work of, in, the, in our case, uh, the work of uh, researcher Scott McIver is here tonight uh, doing some really amazing work in both green roof and uh, biodiversity. So when I was thinking about what to say tonight, I thought of trying to come across with a, uh, one very simple message that I feel very passionately about, and I hope you agree with me on this. But um, when I was trying to come up with the approach of this, I looked to the words of Abraham Lincoln and to help uh, get this message across. And I believe it was Abe that said, all green roofs are not created equal. And so what does that mean? Well, we have a green roof bylaw, as Joe said, and, and coming online uh, a couple of, or a few years ago now, uh, where's the time gone, um, in 2012, that institutional piece. And it's very prescriptive, it has a lot of detail. And it's really impacted the quantity of green roofs across the city. There's no doubt, this is an old study, image I got from the city's website from 2009. But not necessarily, I don't think, the quality. Um, and when I say quality, I'm thinking about the actual performance of these green roofs. In the same way, architects shouldn't design the same uh, house. Oh, I'm out of the light, sorry. <laughs> the, same, uh, the same architecture for every building they design, I don't think green roofs should uh, use the same methodology for every project either. And I'm not specious um, at all, but um, this is sedum, the plant sedum, and it's an amazing proven performer, a green roof performer, the de facto standard in green roofs uh, in Europe, uh, starting in Germany. This little plant that originally grew on the steppes of Europe and has now been translated over here. We don't have any native sedums in Ontario. But it's a really tough performer. In fact, this picture is from the roof. And uh, brilliantly, I think uh, Rob Wright um, put these mats on here, not as part of the main research facility, but left them right on the membrane of the building. And they are doing just fine uh, four years later, um, day in and day out, without any irrigation, with about, I don't know, 19 millimeters of growing media. But I'm not sure that that is the right plant and the right um, methodology, extremely thin, lightweight system for every green roof project in the city of Toronto. Does anybody know who this is? Anybody? <laughs> Grasshopper? It's the emerald ash borer. Pretty guy. Um, the emerald ash borer only eats one kind of plant, one species or genus, actually. Does anybody know what that plant is? Very good. This, this little thing has oh, eaten you? millions of ash trees all over North America and Canada, or sorry, United States and Canada, causing unbelievable destruction. Came over from Asia and has, has wrecked um, massive uh, massively in our uh, province. So one species can really be, be hit. So that's why we want to at least think about mixing these things up a little bit in terms of species, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But in terms of design, every green roof should be considered uh, the same way we consider a project at grade on the ground. Um, <coughs> and we, these are the standard things that we want to look at when we're trying to figure out what kind of plants to use, what kind of soil, how much of it. And these are two of the really key ones here. You know, what's the program? 
What does the client want? What does the builder want? And the other one is really important too, especially to that guy right there, uh, the budget. And the budget varies. But what's also the context that the green roof uh, is sitting in? This is a project that's adjacent to um, a lot of apartment buildings, thousands of people that actually look down on it. Uh, it's adjacent to a river valley. And then starting to look at, you know, those other things. Shadow is a huge impact. Some of these green roofs can be in shade full all the time because of where they're located. Wind is another massive impact that totally changes the growing conditions. But through some of the research, um, and amazingly Canadian research that is before the time of the GRIT lab, but getting Canadian research was so fantastic early on, um, showed that you know, we can actually increase the performance of green roofs in all these areas by simply using more than one type of plant. And by doing that, we also have the benefit of adding more species that are actually supported by this variety of plants that can be used. So the amazing thing for me about green roofs, I think Joe mentioned this, that there's so many different um, impacts that these positive impacts that these things can have there and if we maximize these inputs we can actually maximize the performance in all different areas so i was pleased to be uh, retained by the city of toronto to develop the guidelines that uh, joe mentioned so i just want to talk about these a little bit and through the lens of some projects that are actually pre green roof bylaw and to see how they kind of stack up in relation to these, but I wanted to give you a quick overview of what's in these. I've actually brought a few copies with me. If anybody wants, you're more than ha uh, welcome to help yourself, but they're available on the city's website. This is a team that I put together, and we had a lot of discussion about what biodiversity should be and how it should be approached in terms of a green roof bylaw, you know, a very diverse kind of group ourselves, from a specifier and a contractor to a couple of scientists. Um, But we ended up making it as simple as possible. And that really helps me as a specifier as well. But I think we wanted to keep it really simple. We came up with eight simple strategies to increase the uh, biodiverse performance of a roof. And if you were to ask me if you could only do one of these strategies, which one would it be? This one is the one that's really magic is increasing the depth of the growing medium. If we go from four inches of growing medium to just six inches, just two inches, 50 millimeters, the type and diversity of plants that a green roof can support increases exponentially. But there's other things too. We need to change the composition of the growing medium and not only just use one type up there. If we do, we can support all different types of insects, spiders, and even birds that like these different kinds of uh, growing media. So trying to think about how to use those things. Varying the topography. So in some cases, we can actually get a tree growing in a small little area. There happens to be a column under here that will support this tree as it grows larger. Provide microclimates. Simple little things to vary the types of plants. You know, there's always going to be some shade or sun depending on which side of this log you're on. And that's going to support different kinds of flora and fauna. Diversify the plant species. So sedums are one type of plant species, succulents. But if we can integrate woody shrubs and forbs and grasses, we're going to increase performance in all those areas that I showed you earlier. And then provide opportunities for birds and insects, pollinators, to actually use the garden as well. We know the value, or we're really starting to talk about the value of ecosystem services and how, what a benefit that we get for free out of these things, but how we're impacting them so much through our use of pesticides and uh, reducing and degrading the amount of habitat that these species have available. And then provide nesting opportunities. I used to think of just 
tree um, or birdhouses, but you know, bees like to actually, they can live in this little thing, but they can live in this log and live in these boxes, live in that brick. Um, so thinking about how we can provide uh, houses and, and places for insects and birds to, to live and uh, reproduce. And a key one as well is actually providing water in some way. This has a huge impact on the kind of life uh, that is brought to a site. When you add water, you wouldn't believe how many birds you will see in this area. These things, though, um, are enhancements, and enhancements usually mean more labor and often more materials, and that relates to more cost. So how, if I'm trying to make as, you know, maximize my profit, how am I going to do these? What's going to be my incentive for actually um, doing more? We have to be creative, and we've done a lot of uh, these things are pretty simple. Um, but a couple of things that I think the city is doing, which I think are really interesting, uh, one of them is the new uh, Toronto Green Standard, which is a fantastic uh, standard that we have in the city of Toronto, and Toronto's really to be commended for it, um, is if you go for a tier two, which is second level, it's kind of like going from lead silver to lead gold, you can get a rebate on your development charges. So that might be an incentive. I don't think that's the only one. We're starting to see more uh, of our development clients being interested in that. There is a fantastic eco-roof incentive program that Joe mentioned, and I'm actually pleased to be the first residential recipient of that program. Um, my uh, steeply sloped but extremely lightweight uh, green roof went on in December of uh, a f just a few uh, months ago before the giant ice storm, still there, looking forward to becoming green in the spring. Um, and also at the last best lecture, um, uh, Professor Jen Drake from the Civil Engineering Faculty at U of T talked about how stormwater tariffs are coming online more and more and how those may not impact the... Uh, Does that mean? When, and those won't, may not impact the development costs, but definitely the long-term running costs of uh, operating costs of these buildings. So looking at a few projects, Victoria Park Subway Station, we had to come up with this is the very first TTC project uh, to be designed to have a green roof. And it was a, we needed to be extremely lightweight, um, and it needed to be very modular. TTC likes that, so they can use the same system all over. Um, and it was about uh, three inches of growing medium at the time. So we kind of stacked it up against now, since we'd only developed these guidelines uh, a little, uh, a couple of years ago now, so, to see how it did. And actually, it didn't hit any of them. So, and that is more of a standard kind of green roof in the city of Toronto. Another project uh, that we did, which is an, another retrofit project, so these were existing buildings that we put uh, green roofs on, uh, was this thing at Victoria Park, or at uh, Winford Drive and Don Valley Parkway. <coughs> This thing actually hits all of them, except we didn't provide a water source. And, and so just by varying the amount of soil, the depths, and everything, you get a lot of diversity. And we need to think about how people interact with these things as well. Somebody came up to me and, and said, wow, did you have something to do with that building? I used to look down on this horrible roof all the time, and now it's this beautiful garden. That was very... Uh, that meant a lot to me. And the last project uh, I just want to talk about just at College and Young, just down the street. A series of different roofs, different depths. We actually hit all of them in this one, and it's amazing to be up there. You can't see it in this picture, but the amount of movement from living uh, things like insects, and it's not like mosquitoes or anything like that, but just it's, there's so much movement of birds and insects. It really changes the character of the space. And being able to introduce native plants that, you know, who can ex now people can experience native grasses and wildflowers in this dense part of the city that they wouldn't have that opportunity to regularly. We even planted sumacs up here. I, I, I didn't think they would do as well as they did. They formed this incredible grove, and you get that beautiful color in the fall. Places for urban agriculture, and if I could, one of the questions I would really, or 
things that I really hope is that the Green Roof Bylaw can support uh, urban agriculture because I think it's so critical. Um, I'd like to be able to get my fresh produce not 100 miles away, but a mile away from my house. So I'd like to wrap and say thank you very much for uh, having me. And um, once again, think of these, each of these roofs as an individual design problem. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Scott. Um, it's always a little difficult being the last guy uh, to speak. Just watching the slides thinking, oh, shoot. Oh, he talked about that. He talked about, okay. <laughs> so I got to be real creative here. But actually, it isn't too bad. Um, I want to sort of focus in on the City of Toronto Green Roof Bylaw and, uh, and sort of look at it from a practitioner's perspective. So. Um, we've been, I've sort of watched this happen over a number of years. I was, I was telling Joe that my first green roof was in 2000, which by green roof standards makes me a, an old timer in the industry. Um, and I've watched sort of the development of the industry, watched the effect of the bylaw, and I've been a business person through this whole process, providing products, uh, services, contracting, etc., to the, um, to the uh, uh, clients. Um, those were heady days, sort of back just before the bylaw. I won't mention who we're, we're talking about, but uh, um, it was good times. It was, everyone was very excited. This bylaw was coming out, and, uh, and you know, we knew it would foster a whole industry, uh, and it did. Um, and Scott mentioned, and I wanna, I wanna sort of emphasize the point, um, there is, now that I can look back at it, I see very much a quantity versus quality uh, divergence here. In that, um, not necessarily the quality of green roofs has gone up, but the quantity has gone up exponentially. I mean, from, uh, from before the bylaw to after the bylaw, the number of green roofs that have been done has, has just been unbelievable. Um, but I think that when the bylaw was first created, I think we need to actually think about what economy was created and what performance are we looking for to create that economy. So one type of economy that was created was just basically it pushed a lot of people into a new industry. So a lot of uh, new businesses were started, a lot of green roof systems were created, um, a lot of economy around green roofs was created. But when I think about what the City of Toronto's uh, perspective on this is, I think they actually had some, uh, some more ideas on what would be created. And in order to sort of get a perspective on that economy, I think we have to go back to a study that was done in 2005 by uh, Hitesh Doshi and his team at Ryerson University. And, um, sorry U of T, but uh, this is sort of where it started. And, um, and talk about what exactly they were looking at as the reason for the bylaw. Why do we need a green roof bylaw? Well, um, it was largely based on, or this became the background for a lot of the City of Toronto's impetus to create this bylaw. Essentially, they looked at the usual suspects, what you see, combined sewer overflows, uh, urban heat island effect are the two big ones. They're the ones that have economic impact, measurable impact for the city. And um, we can see, you know, basically from rural to the middle of a city, there's quite an impact in terms of uh, ambient temperature, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of stress on that infrastructure like Joe was talking about. Uh, they came up with some numbers. And I always find these numbers interesting because they're usually big when you're talking about a big city. So we were looking at initial savings of $118 million uh, regarding stormwater, $46 million in uh, savings regarding combined sewer overflow, et cetera, et cetera. Urban heat island effect, you name it, all these catchwords that are associated with green roofs. So my question is quite simply, has the City of Toronto realized these benefits? So taking the 
economic benefits of basically spawning an industry, let's look at if we've gotten the economic benefits out of green roofs according to the performance we're expected to get to create those kind of numbers. And as a, um, as a producer of green roof systems, this is really important to me because I want to be in that sweet spot where we're producing systems that perform, that give the city those opportunities to save money. So what constitutes performance in a green roof? Well, there's a whole range of uh, items that we can uh, um, look at. And Scott actually showed a lot of them in that list of eight or nine items that he had there in terms of the biodiversity. There's just simple aesthetics. It's generally nicer to look at a, uh, a garden than it is a uh, big aggregate roof and, uh, or aggregate covered roof. Uh, generally, that's just a, an aesthetic thing. It could be a, um, a usable landscape where people can go out into pathways, they can enjoy it. Uh, there's a whole lot of things. We have the biodiversity argument about allowing pollinators cor corridors through an urban jungle. Um, those are important things for fruit farmers and, and uh, um, um, those in uh, agriculture. But the two big ones, as I mentioned earlier, are related to water and cooling, water and energy. When someone looks at a green roof like this, and they're thinking water and energy, I don't think this is what came to mind. Neither this. When the plants aren't performing, when things aren't performing correctly, you know that you're not getting the performance that you're expecting to get out of that green roof. Now that's obvious. Those are two obvious failures. But how about these? This is actually a roof right here on the U of T campus. And um, it's a whole beautiful roof of colorful succulents. Uh, moving sort of up the stratum, this might be what you would call a, a semi-intensive or, or maybe a blended planting where it uses some succulents and some uh, other wildflower type species. Um, what does that produce for you in terms of economic performance? Lastly, this is just simply a wildflower meadow in Edmonton. What do they get out of this roof in terms of those two major areas, which is cooling and stormwater? Well, you might be surprised to see that that beautiful, colorful roof on the campus here at U of T holds about 0.2 gallons per square foot of water. Moving up, the next roof I showed you holds about 1.1 gallons per square foot of water. Forgive my imperial measurements, I'm still not quite into uh, figuring out how to do it in metric. But um, lastly, this is a um, system in Edmonton holding three gallons a square foot of moisture in the system. Essentially, the way a green roof is constructed is directly related to how much storm water it's going to hold, what kind of species it's going to be able to support, and thereby how much cooling benefit you're going to get from the plants. So to back up, sedum, which is that common green roof plant, which Scott demonstrated by showing that mat on top of this roof here, it can survive incredibly tough circumstances, low moisture environments, low nutrient environments, but is it the plant that you want to achieve the kind of stormwater mitigation and cooling benefit that the city wants? No, because sedum is a very particular plant that actually holds its moisture in during the hottest times of the day and releases it in the cool of the night making it a very efficient plant water-wise, but a very poor plant for cooling a building. Because cooling, for the most part, is achieved by transpiration out of the plants. So when we have moisture released out of the plants, it creates a cooling benefit. Moving to this one, what's the difference? The difference is in this particular uh, rooftop, you have a, a more rich, uh, media profile for the plants to grow in and you have essentially a meadow type planting 
uh, which is going to, number one, hold more water, and number two, allow the plants to utilize that water more, creating a higher cooling benefit. These are the kind of things that I was looking at many years ago, and I know when they started the Grit Lab project on this rooftop, I was saying, boy, if there's something you could study, it would be this, because this is the kind of roof that creates real economic benefit. Now, aesthetically, some might say, well, I really like the looks of this one, and others will say, I really like the looks of this one, and you're always going to have that different aesthetic standard. But in terms of economic performance, the research that's going on right now makes this argument irrefutable. It's very clear which type of roof creates a better performance in those two areas of stormwater and cooling. So let's talk a little bit about research. Um, I would say at the very beginning, when I was first getting into this industry, all the research was sort of centered around what I would call the German model of green roofing, which is to use a, a succulent such as sedum with a high aggregate, uh, well-draining growing media. The two were a perfect marriage for a very safe green roof, meaning that it will be, um, you could neglect it to a certain extent and it wouldn't cause a lot of trouble. But in terms of stormwater performance and cooling, was it the best option on the table? Well, the first um, little research project we got involved in was down in Atlanta at Emory University, and they wanted to compare a number of different systems. This was the only meadow-type system there. I spoke to somebody recently who has actually gone and visited the, uh, the project, and this system is almost completely dead. This system is barely surviving, and this system has been thriving once they got it past that sort of initial establishment phase. This is all native wildflowers, uh, plants, forbs in, in uh, uh, that region. Moving up uh, through the US, so it's important to understand how plants react in different regional uh, areas. This is the city of New York Parks and Rec building. It's their main building. Um, and uh, what they've done, they're pretty smart. They actually got about 10 manufacturers to all put green roof systems on their rooftop. So examples of different systems on their rooftop. And uh, we had an opportunity to put two of these on and uh, they made it part of their volunteer labor program and it was really quite a, a wonderful experience. But essentially, once again, in terms of performance, what they've been monitoring is the sedum roof is great in terms of it surviving without a lot of help. This one by far is holding way more moisture and producing more cooling benefit. Moving way up into Edmonton, uh, we were involved with Tremco actually on this project. It was kind of a, um, a bit of a sponsored project working with the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. One of the reasons why this fascinated me is because the first thing that I uh, got thrown at me was green roofs really don't work in Edmonton. We've had so many green roofs fail here that people don't want to do them anymore. And I said, well, what kind of green roofs are you putting on? And sure enough, it was the typical prescription of a high aggregate media with succulents. You get the type of extreme climates that happen in Edmonton, and it's a very, very difficult environment for them to survive. So I thought, well, what better way to take a chance on a meadow system? So what we have here is um, a meadow system in four inches of growing media, which by most accounts, most people don't think is possible. Um, it's possible. We're now several years down the road, the maintenance is one cut down per year, no fertilization required, no irrigation required, and it's surviving and thriving. Um, of course, I wanna highlight the project on this rooftop because I think it is actually really groundbreaking research. I have spent so many times in lectures just like this at industry events, hearing people talk about the same research done over and over and over. <coughs> And this is truly unique research in that it compares the whole idea of creating urban meadows 
versus these sedum roofs and what kind of performance you're going to get out of cooling and stormwater uh, differences between the two. Um, some of the early signs are very, very promising in terms of the difference between the two. I was actually shocked myself. I was thinking maybe five, six degrees centigrade difference between the two. In terms of cooling benefit, they're measuring 15 degrees. And uh, I don't know whether that is consistent across the board, but just to even achieve those kind of numbers is pretty spectacular. Um, in terms of stormwater, something I've, I've just known for a long time, the stormwater capacity of these um, meadow type systems is far higher. So in terms of, you know, a lot of people are concerned about water utilization and maybe you shouldn't use these grasses and meadow flowers because they use more water. Well, you also have a media that you marry it to that holds more water. So you're capturing more of a rainfall than you normally would. So one of the, um, an interesting statistic is uh, we have um, played around with different media and we have uh, created systems that are six inches deep that'll hold a hundred year rain event in the city of Toronto. This is the kind of stuff that produces measurable savings for a city. It's the stuff that a city cares about. They're trying to stop these excess uh, stormwater uh, events from overflowing the sewer drains, essentially. And uh, because essentially when it overflows, then we get all the effluent just going right out into the lake, causing algae blooming and all kinds of nasty things um, that come from that. So the city is very, very much interested in holding water and stopping this uh, stress on their um, system. And this is one way of doing it. So if I were to say anything, um, and uh, being the last guy, I think that the bylaw was a great start. It was a fantastic start. It burgeoned a whole industry. It created a whole consciousness about green roofing. But I think we need to take the next step now. If the city's gonna realize the benefits economically that they initially wanted, we can't get into sort of a greenwashing idea where we're putting any green roof down, no matter what its performance level and calling it a day we need to bring green roofs up to a standard that's actually gonna produce real savings for the city. That's it for me. Thank you. I'm going to invite the speakers uh, just to have a seat here because that way you can see them. And I've just prepared some questions and I'm gonna get the first dibs on asking them those questions. And then, um, I'm going to uh, open it up to you people, and you can ask whatever questions you like. My questions are more skill testing, I think. No maple leaves. One of the things that amazes me is how much money we spent to discover that there was a real big difference between six inches and four inches, you know what I mean? I didn't know that we had to spend that much money. I think most people know there's a big difference between four inches and six inches. But of course, we're talking soil. And I, um, but that, you got to do basic research to prove these things. So um, I'm going to start like just with one question, but I'm not going to pose it to all three of you because that's not fair. It'll take us forever to get through this. So, so you know, you, you, Rick, you, you started this out as the last speaker. I'm going to ask you the first question. In your opinion, what, what is the biggest issue or problem that's associated with green roofs in Toronto under the current bylaw? In other words, what, what is the, the one sticking point that, that you think is holding things back from really going forward? I think um, I was uh, privileged to speak once in Pennsylvania uh, to a number of civil engineers and uh, municipal planners. And um, I gave a similar speech to this, albeit a lot longer. And uh, I was asked a very simple question, and it's a question that keeps repeating in my mind, and that's, how do, how do we, as designers of Green Roof, assure ourselves that we're going to get the performance that you say we can get? And the simple answer is, put a number to it. 
It's that simple. If your idea is to save money for the city by holding X number of stormwater, say how much you want to hold. Say that per square foot, we want to hold a minimum of one gallon and let the industry come up and create systems that are going to be able to achieve that. That's simple. And I think as a, as a sort of a second point for the bylaw in terms of you're going through the review process, you're, I think that is a very simple thing to insert to ensure that the city's getting exactly what they need. Well, that, that's similar to what we do with buildings. In many ways, we say we want somebody to create an R25 wall, and there's an entire whack of insulation manufacturers that are going to figure out how to satisfy that code requirement, and the same could be done for water then. Um, I'm going to skip over to Scott. Uh, should green roofs that do not stand a chance of long-term survival, should, should, they, should they actually be prohibited? I mean, once we discover that something is not so great for the Toronto climate, is, 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 should there be a, a, a list of prohibited roof types? Or, or, or do you think that there's always a chance that they could be used successfully in a particular context? I think that, uh, as I said, I think every situation has to be considered. <clears throat> and in, there are many instances where we can only use um, such a, a really, really thin system. And the only plants that are going to survive in there generally are the sedums. Um, but th those systems are, or those conditions are one end of the spectrum. And for the most part, we have projects mid-rise buildings and we've talked to our structural engineers and you know what what does that extra 50 millimeters cost in terms of structure and and there's no cost but in a wood framed building that does have an impact for sure so there is a cost benefit so i think we have to look at every project and and decide okay joe uh, uh, the question i have because we've always had this discussion outside um in in more in the profession so so the, the, a couple of questions. One is, you know, you've got a green roof bylaw. It says that you have to have a certain amount of green roof area. And I'm the building owner. And one question I would have is, well, did I get value for what I had to do? Because I was obliged to do it. And then the other one is, is that, like, in a city like Toronto, is the building department trained in green roof inspections? In other words, do we have what we have under the, uh, under the building code for green roof inspections? Will we ever have someone that will actually come and look, or, or is, that, is that something that's been contemplated, or is it still sort of a, a, a deal with the, in, in this case, the, the landscape architect as the design professional to ensure that the roof has been made to work? How, how, does, how do you think that may pan out in the future? Well, um, taking the second one, I guess, first, uh, the, when it comes to uh, the green roof, this is completely new. So we were given that authority we didn't have anywhere else to look. As a matter of fact, the city of Toronto was the first um, city in North America to have such a bylaw, right? There were some bylaws that applied to some specific types of buildings, but not anything like ours. So um, I think it wasn't crafted for the idea that we're going to have inspectors go up and check these out. Because the other problem is these things are, are highly inaccessible at times, right? They're, they're owned through maintenance staff. So it, it becomes a real challenge. So. Um, I think what the, the way we designed it was to, to have this um, green roof self-regulator, self-policing in that sense. So if you look at the bylaw itself, there's a maintenance plan that's submitted. So we were, we were given enough assurances that it was designed to operate properly um, so that you wouldn't be reliant on the inspector. Not only that, you have to think of the role of the building inspector. The build, role of the building inspector is to look at a building and say, yep, 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 you got it done. Your building permit is now closed. Well, a green roof is, is barely starting. I mean, the, the, you're really what you want to look at is that we want to look at the green roof in two years or three years to see that it still offers. So it posed a completely different challenge. And that's why we're saying, that's why I, I said that we're doing this vegetative study where we're trying to examine ways of looking at these green roofs over time so that we can see them and then we can use another a level of enforcement which is through our municipal licensing and standards people they can enforce bylaws and so they can go through and enforce the the green roof bylaw to say hey you're it's you're not meeting the bylaw requirements which is to to maintain this green roof so it's a it's kind of a second step to this it's a, it's a little different than what we're used to is, is what i'm saying yeah. 
I, I wanted to direct this at Rick because he's, he's been involved with so many uh, green roof construction. Are there any, and, 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 and the guys from Tremco can't answer this question. Uh, are there any kind of roofs that, that you shouldn't be putting green roofs on? And, and, and I'm not talking brands, I'm talking about types. I mean, you've probably been invited to look at a lot of projects and, and I just want to know, is there, in other words, again, is, 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 there, is there something that we shouldn't be doing? That's a political football, isn't it? Well, um, uh, well I'll, I'll do my best on this one. Um, there are certain membranes that we look at that don't have a great track record of longevity. Uh, a green roof is a big investment. I think it's very wise to spend an extra buck or two to have a membrane that has a record of longevity. So that's, that's sort of the overriding uh, principle. Secondly, there are configurations of roofing systems which make the expense of actually dealing with a leak much higher than it would necessarily have to be. Um, for instance, in a conventional system where the membrane is on top of the insulation, if you have a leak through that type of system, the water can migrate quite a distance around on that roof prior to it going through the building and you discovering you have a leak. So I know there's probably a reason why uh, the NRCA recommends green roofs on inverted config configurations and it's probably for that reason. It's the fact that if you find a leak, uh, it's generally located where the breach is. So you only have to take out a small section. Now there are uh, leak detection systems now which mitigate a lot of that risk, but I think as a general rule, that's kind of what we look for. We, we often will uh, comment on certain uh, roofing type systems and um, and lastly, I think there, is, uh, there are some systems which actually warn in their wa warranty literature against ponding water. And uh, I just find that bizarre. Uh, you certainly don't want to have a green roof on a system that warrants against ponding water. And uh, so that's, those are kind of the things we look for without me getting into any manufacturer's names. Um, I think those are the things that we look for when we're, we're uh, advising on green roofing. Just a few more questions and we'll open it up to the floor. I want to ask this one of Scott. Um, you go through a lot of trouble. It's obvious, uh, a lot of, um, I call it creative trouble. You, you, you've designed some lovely green roofs, obviously, and that doesn't come easily. You have to think it through. And then I guess there must be a nagging question always in your mind is whether that's po is going to be properly um, uh, maintained and cared for it, and and and, and is th is there something that you would like to see that that would be enforceable so people would have to properly care uh, for their uh, their green roofs? And in other words, uh, are there are there issues like like one question that always comes up is should some form of irrigation system be mandatory? Is it optional? Uh, wh what's the experience you've had as an architect, a landscape architect? The irrigation question is uh, a <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, a couple of couple sides on every uh, issue, I'd say irrigation type is irrigation yes or no uh, type of soil, as uh, Rick talked about, organic, non-organic. Um, but uh, in terms of the first question, the maintenance issue I'll cover first is um, that's part of the design process too, is understanding what, you know, what kind of maintenance is possible on this roof. Is it, uh, is it going to receive very little maintenance. Um, is it going to receive unskilled maintenance? That, I'm seeing that a lot these days. Uh, oh yeah, we'll just send up the building maintenance person when, it, uh, when it's dry and there's no irrigation on the roof, they can just pull the hose out or put the sprinkler on. Well, I'm not sure the building maintenance person knows how to maintain um, you know, a lawn, let alone you know, kind of a complex system like a green roof. Do they know when it's dry? Do they know that you know, Toronto gets these drought periods when it's happened. So we need to work that into the plan and then incorporate that into the variables that we can affect, the growing media type, the depth of the growing media, how it's actually planted is really important. Is it instant, like one of those mats that I showed? Is it a tray that's fully vegetated? Um, is it seeded? That's a real interesting way to go about things. Um, it can be pretty spectacular over time, but um, 
it needs a spe special care to make that thing successful. So in terms of the irrigation question, that's something I've changed my perspective on a little bit over the last few years. Um, I was almost always recommending to my clients that we irrigate everything. Um, I've received a lot of pushback now that the green roof bylaw is in. Um, oh, I thought the whole point of having a green roof is that you don't need irrigation or you don't need to maintain that thing. Well, you do need both those things. Does it have to be automated? Um, no, it needs to be watered while it's getting established, just like any garden does, because these plants, you know, they don't have established root systems. Unless you have something, a, pre, a fully pre-grown um, tray system <coughs> where the, the plants have had a chance to grow roots beyond there. Um, but through my work um, supporting the, the Grit Lab over the last year, I've actually learned a lot um, to see what the research is showing. They've had three full growing seasons. And so I am seeing, you know, I can look at those <laughs> mats that are on, the, on the, uh, the membrane up there. And yes, those will survive without uh, um, irrigation. And MEC has had one on, or MEC has had one on for, I don't know, since 2000 or something, a, a very similar type of lightweight system. And it's done, it's survived as well. But there's a difference between survival and performance, as both Rick and yeah. I discussed. Okay. Last question to Joe. Like one of the discussions that always comes about is, you know, getting enough soil, obviously, and being able to hold enough water. And and I know it was a topic of discussion that came up. I don't know how far it got, but um, is there ever a thought in the Toronto Green Standard to require minimum strength requirements for roofs? Because when I talk to my structural engineering colleagues, they tell me the cost of increasing the strength of a roof is really peanuts when you're, when you're at that stage. I'm talking now new construction. And should, should we then be sort of making uh, some kind of symbiosis between the, the, the Toronto Green Standard requirement for um, roof uh, load carrying capacity and the type of performance we'd like to get out of green roofs? Is that something that, that, that you think would be a reasonable study to be able to carry out to see if these claims that it really is peanuts are, are, are true? Well, I, I could agree that it's a worthy study. Uh, the, the, prob the challenge we have at the City of Toronto is that the Ontario Building Code, which will, uh, governs that, is, is just that. It's an Ontario Code. It's not uh, something that the city can change. It has to be done by the province. And when they change it, of course, they change it for the entire province. And that's the big challenge. So, you know, you're, you're making changes, and they're more reluctant to make a change just for the City of Toronto uh, when we're the only ones that are requiring this. Um, mainly because the industry, this is the building industry, is generally going in the opposite direction. They're always uh, lobbying to have the standards reduced. In fact, I think that's what they've done. That the, 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 not, not too long ago, they were reduced because they thought, you know, we're not getting snow loads like we used to. So, so let's, you know, so, so, so no, but that, that's they're going in the opposite understand. direction, right? Yeah. So, so you, you're, you're, having, you're having these two forces fighting each other. Um, and so I think, you know, my answer has always been, why can't we have our own code? You know, I mean, but it, it, it's, it's a, that's, a, that's an even bigger battle. I don't, I don't think I'll ever see that in my lifetime, but, but I think that's probably the, 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 the answer is to, to, to allow um, municipalities like Toronto to move in that unique direction. Look what we've done with the green roof. Right? We, got, we got regulation to allow, to require a green roof, and look what's happened. It's, it's spawned a whole new way of looking at roofs. And not only an industry as well, and I think that's just terrific. So I think a lot of that could be answered if the province would allow us that flexibility to. But but I guess to get back to what Rick was talking about, I guess indirectly, if you did have a performance requirement for water retention capacity, it would imply that you would have to design the roof to be able to carry that, which means you wouldn't have to change the building code, which means that you would have this nice little end run that would get you where you want to go. So I think at that point. Um, you know, it could prove interesting. We have a microphone here that is uh, going to go out to whoever uh, is interested in asking the panelists some questions. We have some time for questions. And after that, we end up having a, a complimentary um, reception out, out in the foyer uh, with, with snacks and refreshments. But uh, is there anybody here that has... Uh, yes, there's a person over here. Well, you know, we have this recorded, and right now it's live, and there's about 17.2 million viewers. <laughs> but, but no, no, don't worry. Just go ahead and ask your question. 
All right, I've got a question for, for the city, Mr. DeBramo. We have a really unique situation in Toronto where we have a really progressive urban agriculture movement, and then we've got the Green Roofs bylaw, but where they both come together in rooftop urban agriculture, it's really a, a fledgling industry that's just getting started. And I was wondering if you could speak to the intent of the city to expand that further in the coming years, if there is intent. We, well, uh, <laughs> I think we have a lot of intents at the city. And in fact, I could tell you I sit on a, a, a staff committee that is looking at urban agriculture as an issue uh, across the city and, and how the city can promote that. Um, it's not necessarily on roofs right now, but, but there is that start. And maybe I think it, I can see um, the discussion progressing eventually to that point where um, we look at not only just uh, grade-related urban agriculture, but uh, what about roof-related? When that discussion comes up, it's going to bring about what I said earlier, is that you have this, what appears to be a conflict at this point, because the Green Roof Bylaws, not, I would say, does not take into account urban agriculture. So we're going to have to address that. And again, I think it's one of those situations where we're going to have to put our mind to um, how do we change the bylaw to accommodate that and yet achieve our other objectives? Because that's now a new objective, right? Remember that list of benefits? Okay, now you've got at the bottom there, you're going to have add you know, growing crops so people can eat them. You know, and, and that's great, but it, it's just, how, the, how, does that, how does that match up with all the rest of them? You know, can we do it all? Um, that, that'll be the challenge. And we'll, we'll likely, I, I can imagine we're gonna be looking at it. I just can't say that I have a timeline for you. Anybody else out there? Yes, I think we'll get a mic to you in just a sec. This, so all of you know, usually, usually our guest speakers hang around for a while because I twist their arm with free beverages. And uh, so that means you could also ask them questions in person if you're, if you're shy to speak into the microphone or uh, for whatever reason. Anyway, so go ahead. This is actually for the city, but any, anyone can respond. My understanding is that the bang for your buck in terms of stormwater mitigation is much better for at-grade interventions. For example, let's say rain gardens. So I'm wondering if the city is thinking of, I know often in dense urban settings that's not possible, but pursuing that um, in addition to, because it can be very expensive to get what Rick is talking about isn't always optimal rainwater mitigation with a green roof, when there may be a, other more cost efficient, I guess, interventions. We do already have measures like that. Um, uh, we do collect rainwater on site, it's retained for a, a while. Um, so as to be released at, at, at a later time, especially during a storm event. So we do have these measures that are built into a lot of these buildings. So we do a lot more than just green roofs. I think the green roofs is, is just an additional option. And I think what we're, we, we'd like to progress to is, is kind of have a series of performance measures that a building owner can, can look at to uh, meet up with what we might have as a target of stormwater retention on site um, given, given particular uh, rain events. That's the way we t tend to deal with it. Uh, so it's not just one option, it, it is several options and it already exists. Okay, well, there is one more question and then we'll break for snacks and refreshments. How does insurance uh, come into play with this? If there's no inspections, does this raise your insurance rates? Does this have anything to do with insurance? Like, if there's no inspections being done on a regular basis? Um, I, have, I have never really uh, uh, heard of that myself. I've, I've not had anyone come to me in the industry and say, my insurance rates have changed because I put a green roof on. Um, I don't there are, know. There are actually certain um, certain insurance implications like uh, FM Global is one uh, large insurance company that actually insures a lot of public buildings and they actually have a standard, a green roof standard that you have to abide by and um, I know our company has gone through a, a lot of work just to get an FM approval um, number essentially because they're concerned about green roofs and they want to make sure they're done a certain way so that the building they insure they will, uh, will do what it's supposed to do. 
So, but they're about the only major insurer I know that has required that level of, uh, of scrutiny. So. And the, the bylaw does require um, a maintenance plan. So after the thing is installed, the green roof is installed, it has to be maintained in a certain way um, that we have to actually put, put a detailed plan together. And even after that period is up, um, <clears throat> there still has to be an ongoing as part of the, the bylaw. It says that it must be maintained to a certain standard uh, going forward after that period. I think where we stand right now is that uh, there's the insurance, the insurance industry, uh, I was speaking at a symposium on this on basement flooding, is far more concerned about basement flooding and green roofs do a lot to alleviate basement flooding problems. But if you saw what they paid out in the last flood in Toronto, it was staggering and I don't think their radar is in any way worried about green roof performance for insurance rates. I think they're thinking about how they avoid having to pay for people with pl flooded basements because Canadians tend to put so many of their valuable possessions in basements now. So it's one of those re weird cultural things that's happened. But anyway, that's an aside. Uh, Canadians in basements, try to explain that to somebody in Atlanta, Georgia. They just don't understand it. So um, thanks everyone for, for, for making it out this evening and thanks very much to our speakers.